Hello, I'm Catherine Lana, and today I'm joining the novelist Saskia Sargentson at her desk. We'll be talking about her new book, The Bench, published September 2020. It's a beautiful, warm and engaging love story taking place in the 1980s in Atlantic City, America and in London. And it's quite different from Saskia's other novels, which are mainly thrillers and often set in Suffolk, which is where she was brought up. The flat, watery landscape and big skies have continued to appeal to her and she visits family in the county whenever she can. But she's built her life in London with family and a career which was first in journalism and PR and then after taking a creative writing course in Cambridge she's written a number of best-selling novels including The Twins which was a Richard and Judy book club title. So why this departure into romantic fiction? Let's find out more. Well um it's very nice to see you here. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, and I wondered if, um, first of all, we could talk a little bit about the book, uh, the new book, The Bench. I've read it already and I very much enjoyed it. And I wondered if you could just explain a little bit about the plot. Well, it's, it's very definitely a love story. And um, it's, it's as love stories tend to, to be, they are, it's basically a story about two people who are magnetically drawn together, who really love each other, but through circumstances beyond their control are parted. And um, so it's a book about Kat and Sam, and um, they meet, um, Sam is an English musician uh, running from a betrayal. And Kat is, is a girl who's struggling to support her parents. She actually works in a funeral parlor. She'll do anything in order to, she has dysfunctional parents that she's supporting and she sort of feels a bit trapped by. And she lives in Atlantic City, USA. And um, he's passing through, he's, he's traveling and he passes through and they, they meet it and are very, you know, immediately drawn together. And um, despite the fact they come from very different backgrounds, they fall in love and they decide that they're going to make a life together. And, um, but he has to go back to um, England because his visa's run out. And then something goes wrong, a white lie has been told, and that means that they are then separated for many years, in fact. Um, but the it's called the bench because they meet on a bench. And then he has um, a bench in, um, on Hampstead Heath, which he loves. And, she tries to find him there and this bench keeps coming up throughout the novel and um, in fact the book starts on a bench because we start at the end with them her there's a girl waiting on a bench a woman waiting for a man and so we don't know whether he's going to turn up and whether they're going to be able to rekindle this relationship that's been through so much and it's it's a lovely idea and it's it's beautifully done and it's a little bit different from the books that you've written so far um from my experience i haven't written or read all of your books but um can you tell us a little bit about why you've decided to write in this particular style it's a slight departure from what you've written before isn't it so how did it come about yes i think it came about well i've been playing with genre for a long time in in all of my novels and i tend to mix it up and have you know I might often have a historical element to it and um, it might be a little bit of mystery or psychological suspense. I will always have a love story in there though, always, always. And I, and I love writing very emotional scenes and, and, and I enjoy writing about love. And so I decided that, you know, for this book, I had this idea anyway, and I felt this could be the time that I focus in one genre and I just write a love story, very pure and simple. And I really enjoy doing it, actually, and I'm definitely going to do it again. It's, um, yeah, it, it was a pleasure to, to just focus on this one genre and to write a love story. Yeah. It, it really was. So I will definitely, I'm doing it now for another book as well. So. Right. Well, we'll, need, we'll need to come back to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, but you talked a little uh, about the, uh, the plot of it mm -hmm. and the fact that there are some miscommunications and the white lie, mm -hmm. which is beautifully done. It, it's very cleverly plotted so that you're always on tenterhooks as to whether they're going to get it together or not and, and what's going to happen next. But that, that must be quite difficult to get that balance right. It's quite an intricate um, plotting that you've done to make sure that we, we are being led along in that, that mm -hmm. thread. Did you find that difficult or, or was it a book that just fell together? What was the process like for you in putting it together? Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I would say that books, for me, books never just 
just come together. They're, they are, it is the plotting which is the hard bit. And so I, the emotion of the love story, the connection between them felt very real and natural to me. So that, that was something that I suppose in a way came easily. But yes, the plotting was tricky, um, getting the timelines right and, and, and the incidences that kept them apart. Because like you say, you don't want to make it too obvious or you don't, you know, you want, to, you want the reader to feel a sense of frustration, but also a sense of hope. But also you don't want the frustration to be manufactured too much. It needs to feel really natural. So yes, that was quite tricky to do. And it did take a lot of rewriting, actually. I did quite a few drafts on this one. How did you first stumble across your two characters and how did you get to know them? Uh, it, it's as usual, it, I usually start with a very, well, a fairly strong idea about who they are. Um, but then it's interesting because the more you write, the more you realize who they are, the more you get to know them. And so sometimes you have to go back and thread in elements of their character that you didn't understand or know at the beginning. And you go back and you, it's like doing a bit of needlework or something. You start off by roughing it out and you can see what it is. But the more you sew, the more you realize that you've missed a color here or a shape there and you have to go back and thread it in. And so it was, it was like that. It's, it is with all characters, I think. It's, we are all very complex human beings. So trying to create a complex human being, you have to, it doesn't just come immediately. There are all these different shades, yeah. And of course it's set in, is it the 1980s? So there's, there's a time element here as well in that it needs to be authentic for some of the uh, procedures and uh, obstacles that would be involved in that time which of course no mobile phones and they, they did have a few communication issues mm -hmm. how do you make sure that you keep that authentic that you um how much do you check up on yourself to to make sure that it's all correct if you like and how difficult it is it stepping back into that period which seems well, so recent doesn't it, it does. <laughs> it's, it's, it's recent past isn't it and, and i remember the 80s so um for writing about the 80s in England was not difficult for me at all. It wasn't a great big leap to, uh, to remember what it was actually like. Um, and then when it came to America in the 80s, I, I w watched a few films you know, that were set in the 80s, American films. I mean, Atlantic City, the, the film Atlantic City is set in, in the 80s as well. So that was very helpful for getting a, a look at the city itself. And um, then there were other films like um, Heathers and um, there were various films about younger people set in the 80s that I, I had a look at, um, just for, for dress and background and, and things. For, for this particular book, there wasn't as much research as there has been for some of the other books I've written. So I did start off by doing a, about a month of research. And also it was setting it, I decided to set it in America. I originally was going to set it in, um, Wales actually there was going to be a, a cat was going to come from Wales from Tiger Bay and um, but then I decided to move it across the pond and have it come from America because it was such a big gulf between them then so um, and so then I picked on Atlantic City as being something that I felt was perhaps a bit closer to Tiger Bay I wanted to have a city that was you know where her father could actually gamble and where you know it, it was a it was a very mixed city with you know sort of the money and the glitz and then the poverty and the you know the poorer part of it which was actually quite had dangerous elements to it as well so um i obviously had to look into that because i would never been to atlantic city so i had to really do quite a lot of research in, into that but then i started writing once i feel like once i had a feel of my location then i could start to write um and then one or two things cropped up as i was writing in the plot which i had to then do some research into but the main thing was the setting and the period, and I did spend time doing that before I started writing. And do you write chronologically? Do you, have you got it all planned out and then you know that you have to do this chapter, this chapter, this chapter, or do you dot around? I mean, what you were talking about earlier about the, uh, the tapestry idea of filling things in, how much of it is, is dipping back or, or writing a scene that you particularly um, feel strongly about, and how, how much is it writing in, in succession for the, for the chapters? Uh, I pretty much always write chronologically. I, I just, I feel because then you're building the story um, in your head, especially with this one. With some of the other books, I've jumped around in time more. So that's, but I've always still written it as I see it happening in the book, even though I might be jumping back in time. So a flashback, I will put the flashback when it comes in the book. 
Um, so I will still be writing if you see, so that, although it's not chronological, so I've done a flashback, the flashback will happen at the right time in the book that I feel it. I might move it later, but I'll write it when I feel it should come to tell us, you know, inform us as to backstory, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So basically I, I'm writing chapter by chapter. Yeah. So tell me a bit more about your working day then. How do you embark on writing each day? Where do you, where do you need to be? How do you set yourself up? What, how do, what's involved? So when I first started writing, it was more the children that I had to think about. Now my children are grown up, it's my dogs. So uh, I have three dogs, so they need to be walked before I can sit down and write. So I generally um, get the walk done first. That means I don't usually start writing till mid morning, probably 10 o'clock or something like that. Um, and then I have to have a coffee. Uh, so once I know the dogs are sorted, then I can sit down with my coffee and um, start writing. Usually I do a bit of emailing and things first to get that out of the way. And then I'll just switch everything off. I switch all of my notifications. I'll put my phone on silence and I'll even leave it in a different room because I don't want to be distracted. It's quite difficult writing at home because of course there's all the domestic stuff and I'll think, oh God, I need to put that wash on. But I've got to try and get that out of my head. Um, and it can be tricky, which is why sometimes I do go away to write. Um, I'll, I'll go to Suffolk because my sister lives in Orford and she has a barn and I, I'll sometimes I'll go, which has got a bed and everything in it. And sometimes I'll just go and stay there or I'll rent a cottage and because then you can get right away from real life as well. But if I'm in London, then I'll just try and do my best to shut everything out. I need four to five hours really to get anything done. Right. And what are the components that you need in getting that right? You've talked about the silence, but what about, um, is it a notebook and pen, a laptop, a desk, or do you lie on a bed? How, how, how do you need to be in the right position even? Uh, generally for writing, I like to be sitting at a desk because um, I, I think it's something to do. I can edit sitting on a bed. I can edit anywhere, but for writing, I prefer to be at my desk. And I, I write straight into my laptop but I would have always written notes first and I will always rough out an idea for the next chapter in my notebook first. Um, and for the, yeah, I mean, I will do, I'll do a, a synopsis and then I'll work into the synopsis and try and make it more detailed. And then I'll start picking apart chapters. And so I will, yeah, I will write, sometimes I write a few chapters ahead of my note, notebook, just doing notes of what I know has to happen next. And then I'll go to my laptop and I'll put it straight in. Because yeah. that's the beauty of this technology that we have nowadays. It's being able to throw something down and then really work into it if you need to. Yeah. When you are going to a different time period, so we were talking about the 1980s for this particular book, do you have any prompts that you um, bring to your desk, your laptop, to allow you to step easily into that world? Or are you so immersed that it's, it's all in your head anyway? I mean, how, how do you get into the the period get into your world it's kind of in my head once it's in my head it's in my head and i'm living and other people i mean people know when i'm writing because i am much more uh, un, unfocused in the real world and much more focused in my head and i find it quite difficult to step out of that and um communicate with people sometimes i'm so kind of lost in my world i occasionally i'll put pictures up on uh, of places occasionally on on, a, on my court board but I don't really tend to do that. I tend to kind of more, I'll write timelines down and I'll, I'll write character notes and put those up to remind me because I'm, I'm, um, I'm a bit bad at numbers. So I have to be really careful about timelines and dates and ages. I can quite often trip up and get those wrong. So I, I need to remind myself sometimes. And you mentioned that you like to have a good four or five hours. What about interruptions? How do you cope if there are interruptions? If there are, well, I, this house gets in, I mean, now I've got two, two of my older children living at home at the moment. My partner's writing from and working from home at the moment. So we get constant deliveries. So yes, there are interruptions and it is really annoying. And the dogs will bark if somebody goes past the house. Sometimes I'll get a lot of barking going on. I think you just have to, I think being a woman, I'm so used to the multitasking that women have to do anyway, that um, I can manage to do that and come back into the zone. Sometimes it's, it, it can, it, if you're in the middle of a sentence, it's really annoying, but on the whole, I can manage. And what about at the end of the day? Do you need to have um, a technique to unwind or do you like to unpick what you've written with um, other members of the family, for example? Do you like to talk about what you're writing while it's a work in progress? 
on the whole, I, I do, but it doesn't make much sense to them until they've read the book. So, um, yeah, I tend to just, I, un I mean, I have to do another dog walk at the end of the day. So that's a good unwinding period. My partner's brilliant in that once he's read a rough draft, I can then discuss things with him. And he's really great at talking me through things and, and coming up with other angles and ideas, which I can talk about with him. But otherwise, I tend not to really talk about it with anybody um, once my editor's read a draft and then again, I discuss it with her in, in great detail and we can have brainstorming sessions. And that's really helpful too. Do you ever, ever have any times where you think this really isn't working and I need to throw it away? How, how do you cope when you, you've come across an obstacle and a barrier to, to the writing? How do you overcome it? I think it's, um, I, I, I tend to think I can make this work all the way through. But then usually there will come, I always start off by falling in love with my story, being really passionate about it, really excited, feeling it has huge potential. Then there will always come a time when I fall out of love with it. I hate my writing. I think it's terrible. I, 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 I wish I hadn't done it. I wish that I could start again with something else. But I force myself to go through that difficult time. It's like being in a relationship and hitting a problem. You fall out of love with somebody. You have to, you have to make yourself believe in what you saw in the first place and come back to it again and mm. it, you have to be very tenacious and just carry on and it could be many many drafts down the line when you actually see the idea you first thought about emerge and you just have to stick with it i mean i have never got to the point where i've just thrown a story away i would do that if i really felt it wasn't working but so far touch wood i've never done that so <laughs> And what about getting distracted by other ideas? You, you say that you're, you're working on another book now, so it's sort of straight away onto the next one sort of consecutively. But what about if you were distracted while you were writing one book, thinking, oh, that's a really good idea for the next book or another book? And it might seem a little bit more tempting to start writing that and, and get sidelined from what you're working on at the moment. Do you have that issue at all? That's never happened. Funnily enough, I don't let myself think about anything else until I've finished the book. Once I've, once I've, once I've got to, you know, I mean, a book can then be in maybe the sub editing part of it. But once it's left me and gone off to the publisher, even though I might still be fiddling with it, it's actually gone. And then I like to have a few weeks where I try not to think about anything just to clear my head. But inevitably, some ideas will start to creep in. And then I'll start to have sleepless nights wondering about this idea and whether I can actually make it work and what's missing and if I need something else and yeah and but it I tend not to, it's too my my brain is not that big I can't hold <laughs> that that in my head as well as dealing with another book yeah so tell me where you are at the moment because you're in London and um you're home in London and this is the room where you've written a number of books so can you yeah. just describe uh, where where you're sitting and where you would normally be uh, sitting to write the book? Uh, yeah, I'm sitting at my desk in um, the corner of what is in fact my bedroom. Um, so I'm at a window. This is a big window that overlooks. I'm very lucky actually because I'm in a very quiet street and it overlooks a, a walled garden. So I see a lot of trees and greenery and there's a lot of bird song, which is lovely. Um, also people walking up and down the street, uh, which occasionally can be distracting, but normally I don't notice them. Uh, but if I'm in this room, the dogs can lie on the bed. So there's um, sometimes a, an aroma of, of dog, which is quite a, <laughs> a bit overpowering occasionally, but it's lovely to have their company and they just sleep usually. And yeah, I tend, I've got a lot of my favorite books behind me in, in my bookcase. Um, and because I think like all writers do, I think if I'm a bit stuck, sometimes just reading a book, I might've read it a million times, but I think it's brilliant. Just reading that book will inspire me to then to go back to my own book. Um, so sometimes I do, I'll just pick up a book at random and just read it and it can just spark something in my head and I'll yeah. go back to my own book. Um, so I like to have books around me. Um, I've usually got a cup of coffee or a bottle of water on the go. And I have my notebooks. I always write in, in my Moleskill, Moleskin notebooks, like um, this yeah. one. I like, like this sort of size and I can just scribble in, in, in that. And the books though, that's, that's an issue in itself is, is mm. when to read other people's books and how to enjoy them. Because some, some people are very superstitious about reading other people's writing when, when they're working on something. So it's great to hear that you, you get inspiration from, from other writers. Um, was there an, a particular book that you found solace in while you were writing The Bench? Can you remember? <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. I, 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 
I, I read a bit about I read a bit about sort of funeral parlors and things like that to kind of get my head round what it would be like to actually work in a funeral parlor. Um, but there wasn't really a work of fiction as such. I mean, I would just it's it's a funny thing, and I've I've talked to other writers about this, and people have said the same thing. You can be reading a book that's completely different from your book, a different genre, a different period, even. But there's something about it which will trigger something in your brain, which sends you back to your book. It's such an odd thing, but it, it can. So I tend to read people I really admire, books that I absolutely love. You know, Sebastian Barry, Maggie O'Farrell. Um, you know, there and Tyler. There are so many. Um, that's the dogs in the door. There, there are so many um, brilliant writers that that I find inspiring, challenging. You know, I just I love to read books that I think are wonderful that I aspire to. What do you hope for the book in, in such a difficult um, circumstance? Uh, so, I mean, it's a book which I think is, is good for this time. I mean, a lot of people have said, oh gosh, you know, it was so nice to read a book that gave me hope that, um, you know, you could lose yourself in. And, and, it, and it talks in the end about, you know, about the good parts of humanity and about, you know, the positive things in, in all of us. So. Thank you. Well, that, that's a good, good place to, to finish. So thank you so much for your time because it's been lovely speaking to you and finding out a bit more about your writing process. And I wish you every success with this book, which I did love. So thank um, you. I look forward to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thanks for having me. Thanks.